From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi, and welcome to another John Hannam Meets archive. Back in 1949, two brothers from Yarmouth, Isle of Wight, made history by crossing the Atlantic in a 20-foot boat. Today, my archive goes back to 1999, when I interviewed Colin Smith on the 50th anniversary of their epic voyage. Sadly, Stanley died a few years earlier. To celebrate the life of Colin Smith, who died in early 2018 at the age of 96, I'm going back to that interview in 1999. Another Hannum Archive. Colin, that makes you feel like the sea, doesn't it, really? It certainly does, yes. <laughs> now, Kachaturian, I'm sure he didn't have the sea and those beautiful little trading schooners sailing along <laughs> when he wrote um, Spartacus. I but it, somehow it seems to fit in there beautifully. It was the Aeneidan line theme. That's right. Gorgeous, really, I wasn't think that's the best marine programme we've had for a very long time. Telling me. Happy anniversary, because it's 50 years ago when you actually sailed across the Atlantic in a 20-foot boat, but I want to yes. keep that on ice for a few minutes. I want to, to delve right back into your life, because you were actually... Uh, the family had a boat-building business in Yarmouth, didn't That's they? That's correct. My Would grandfather you started that. Did he? In fact, he started building up in Oxfordshire. Then, after so many years there, he built a lot of very successful raters and class of boats of that sort, moved down to Southampton Water, over to Fawley, and then later moved over to Yarmouth. First of all, he went into the old stone house. I believe that was around about the turn of the century, and then moved into the little yard alongside the institute at Yarmouth, where the business carried on for goodness knows how many years now and packed up just a few years ago. Did it? Because I know Father was the, the coxswain of the local lifeboat for a while. He was, he? yeah, for some years, in fact. So what do you remember about Yarmouth, going to Yarmouth School and growing up in, in the town, really? Well, uh, Yarmouth itself was a lovely little place. It still is, but um, not quite the same sort of atmosphere now as before. Um, there were a lot more, far more children about, as I remembered in those days, all about our own age, I suppose, Lots more larking about and so on. Lots more freedom, I think, too. We didn't have cars tearing through the place as we do now, of course. But then that applies to every place, of course. Did you have traffic lights on that bridge or not in those days? I remember those days. Oh, when that, those traffic lights went up there. We all went up and marvelled at it. We'd never seen anything like that in modern science before, of course. <laughs> they were the first lights on the island, actually. I believe they, they were. Yes. After a while, Colin, you had to go to Scotland because Mum was not too well, was she? No, she wasn't. No, my mother, who came from Scotland up in Murrayshire, uh, contracted uh, TB and there were not the, the same facilities or curatives and things like that then as there are now. And so uh, she eventually went up there when they could do very little more for her. And I, being the youngest of the brood, about four or five at the time, went with her. My father had the job of looking after my elder brother and sister. How he managed it, I don't know. That was just a few years before the general slump and things weren't too uh, good even at that time. But my Scottish years were quite happy ones, I have to say, in spite of the circumstances. And when I came back to the island again after my mother died, I returned to the, the school at Yarmouth and I con contracted, I suppose, that the term, the name Scotchy Colon. <laughs> Scotchy because of my accent, I could hardly understand anyone around me at that time. <laughs> Colin, because we had a, a very nice teacher at that time, but she insisted that my name, having only one L in it, should be pronounced Colin, not Colin. <laughs> so there it was. But they were happy years, all the same. 
Eventually, you went to Saunders Row, who at that particular time were well known, particularly for flying boats, weren't they? They were, yes. I consider I had two apprenticeships in my life with my father, first of all, and um, with Saunders Row. And I was with Saunders Row, first of all, on the Saro Londons, and then eventually, during the early part of the war, it went on to walruses. Now, at that time, there was a system by which um, you couldn't join the armed forces if you were in a reserved occupation. Both my brother and I found ourselves in that situation. He was with British Powerboat Company over at Hyde at that time. I tried about three or three or four times, I believe, going over to Portsmouth, try, trying to persuade them to let me into the Navy or freight air arm, but they wouldn't have it. Then, almost by chance, I heard that one could get into the RAF if one could um, pass all the tests and exams, etc., and get into flying training. I immediately applied. I was very lucky, and that's what happened. But just prior to that... There was that big blitz on cows, and I was working night shift at that time, and uh, I was in the firm's night shift fire brigade, among other things. I was also in the home guard and doing that sort of thing, in spite of doing, what was it, um, 12 hours a night for, what was it, six nights a week, I think. I don't know how we did it. Was there a Polish boat in there at that time? There was. A Polish ship called the Blitzkowice. That takes some pronouncing, of course. <laughs> two of them, two Polish destroyers had been built at John Samuel White's just prior to the war. The Grom, thunder, Blitzkowice, meaning lightning. The Blitzkowice had come back just at that time, I think it was early 1942, uh, for a refit. And um, somehow the Germans had heard about this, or somehow they decided that they were going to have a go at Saunders Row, I don't know which, and um, there was a full-scale blitz on cows that night. And um, Blitzkowice really did herself great credit there. There's a plaque on cows' front at the moment about that. Anyway, when the sirens went, we turned out, and with our funny little fire brigade, turned out to one of the yards down at John Samuel White's. They'd had a big fire there, and we thought we might do our little bit down there, our own firm not having been damaged. That was going for a bit... And um, then later, a second siren went, and the second raid came in. Now, during both of these raids, we were almost deafened by almost constant fire from the Blitzkowice, as well as some of the other guns around the place. And I think I'm right in saying that she was credited with bringing most of the 13 German aircraft down that night. So it was quite a night. Night And very shortly after that, I... Um, joined the RAF. I, I'd already joined it. I was on deferred service and I was called up to start just a few weeks after that occasion. Put that light out! I'm trying to relax and listen to John Hannum. <laughs> Superb cue from my current live guest, Colin Smith, because we're going to talk about the war. You actually joined the RAF. And That's correct. I know you had this fascination in the end for Canada because you went to Canada, didn't you? We did. Yes, that was part of our training. That was the flying training part of our course there. Um, I should say that my brother also managed to get into the RAF when he found out what I'd done and how I'd said about it. But he was always about five months behind me uh, on different courses, obviously. About the only time in my life when I ever have been ahead of him, I think. (laughs) We loved it out there. And, um, of course, we worked ourselves to death, of course, on this course. But we were surrounded by chaps of our own age, generally speaking, and we thoroughly enjoyed it and we loved Canada and the Canadian people themselves and we thought well now that's where we ought to go after the war again but um, leaving Canada we came back to Britain for a while went out to India for a while into Burma very briefly and then it was the end of the war we were in too late to do very much in fact in that direction and then you came back to Yarmouth I came back to Yarmouth for a while briefly I say briefly it was quite a few months in fact um, Stan put an idea to me. What about buying that lovely old um, cutter I saw down at uh, Poole? She's up for sale, very reasonable, £450. <laughs> about 400 and something thousand, I expect, these days. But um, <laughs> anyway, a beautiful old cutter, 45 feet long, a, a draft of 7 foot 6 and so on. All her gear was in perfect order, but she'd been laid up during the war and a lot still remained to be done to her. 
and we were talking still about going back to Canada. Stan came up with the idea, now what about sailing that old boat out there and um, we'll have a home ready, live aboard there, etc., etc. And um, that's what we did plan for a while. But um, we had some nice cruising down the channel, but on one occasion, coming back from Falmouth, she sprang a leak. We were somewhere off Eddystone, and it was quite a fast leak. The pump wouldn't um, keep pace with it. And so, with the two of us, one down in the after cabin, the other sailing the boat, we were bucketing the water out, and we were doing that continuously for five hours until we got into Plymouth. By that time, we were almost completely exhausted, and it was getting dark by that time, and an old fisherman going out for his night's um, fishing um, directed us into the inner harbour, we put the boat up against the key wall where she grounded almost at once. The tide was going down very fortunately. And uh, we soon discovered where the leak was, right down in the garbage, about six feet below the water line. And we caught her up, had a good night's sleep, and then sailed on back the following day. But that uh, taught us a lesson. If that had happened out in a few hundred miles or a, few, a couple of thousand miles or in the middle of the Atlantic, things wouldn't have been quite so healthy, of course. <laughs> and so we ditched that plan. Plan 2 came into operation then. My father built a beautiful little boat just after the war called the Phoenix, very similar to boats he'd been building before the war. She was um, just over 20 foot long and a half-deck, clinker-built boat. And we thought, now, if we had a boat like that, we could easily sail across the Atlantic. Did you? (laughs) But um, we decided that we would, in fact, go out to Canada, build the boat there, and, of course, nobody would know us there, and uh, so we would advertise ourselves as our boat builders and that our faith in the sort of craft we built, sail it across the Atlantic and sail it back again. That was the original plan. And so um, I think it was Mar- early March, 19... What would it have been now? 1949, of course. Mm. We um, took a passage out on the old Aquitania, one of Did our you? last passages, in fact. Fortunately, she was berthing right in Halifax Harbour, now, we had no reason for going any further than that. So we settled right there to build the boat. But we had all sorts of difficulty finding the, just the right materials that would suit us. Anyway, I must go into the technicalities a little bit here. She finished up. We designed her on the way across. We've got most of the lines out on the way across the Atlantic. Well, on the Aquitania. She's a 20-foot, half-deck, uh, fin keel boat, clinker-built and um, she was rigged as a gunter lug. Now, that meant a comparatively short mast with a gaff when she was under full sail extending up another six feet above the mast. As you reef the boat, so you reduce, in effect, the effective height of the mast. Now, a half-deck boat is not really the thing to sail across the Atlantic or do any um, offshore work in. So we built a, a reverse clinker dinghy pram dinghy to fit over most of the cockpit, leaving just a very small space at the after end. And um, we lashed this one down on the deck just after the mast position. We had um, a watertight compartment up forward in the boat with a little watertight door inside. And we also had another watertight compartment at the after end of the boat um, sealed with a little hatch on deck. There was a a fairly shallow combing, and it fitted down over that, and there was a brass band over the top which clipped in so that the hatch couldn't possibly come out unless we undid it. That's what we thought anyway. We we were wrong on that one, as we were on a number of other things. (laughs) So, finding a space to build it in Halifax was a bit of a problem, but we eventually did settle on the basement of an old disused chapel. We set about um, getting our materials... And again, still briefly on the technical side of things, the main backbone and all the main strength members, the backbone, the keelson, hog, etc., and the floors, they were of American white oak, very fine timber. The planking was to be three-quarter inch American white pine. The decking was the same white pine, but obviously not clinker planked, and it was to be painted and uh, canvas covered. Nova Espera, wasn't it? Nova Espera, that was the name. <laughs> um, Esperanto, for New Hope. What did you do the night before you sailed across the Atlantic? You, went, you had a nice meal, didn't you? <laughs> I had a beautiful meal. We had a friend who had arrived in Canada from England um, 
came out a month or two after us, as a matter of fact. And he was a, a paper, a newspaper correspondent, in fact, before he came out there. And he was always looking for a bit of a story, of course. And he discovered, of course, that on the other side of the harbour at Halifax, there was a little town called Dartmouth. Now, Dartmouth, England, is, I think, our favourite port. It's a lovely spot down in Devon. And apart from Yarmouth, Isle of Wight, of course, that is a number one port to us. And so he arranged that the mayor should come down and give us a bit of a send-off and uh, give us a letter to deliver to the mayor of Dartmouth, England. That's how it all came about. We turned up late, I have to admit, <laughs> scruffy, all the gear stowed away down below. We could barely move, well, we couldn't move down below. It hadn't been stowed properly or anything like that. But we turned up there, and there was the mayor with his chain of office and several councillors around him up on the quayside. And he gave us a very nice send-off speech. And at the end of it, he said, Wow, chaps, now that's finished. You come on up home, we're going to give you a good feed before you go. <laughs> we had a lovely feed there. <laughs> and um, later, as we set sail out of uh, Halifax Harbour and got the first um, rolling of the Atlantic uh, rollers, I have to admit that I lost a lot of that dinner over the side. <laughs> Fancy you being seasick. Yes, it was terrible. John Hanam is on the air now. Hanum, Hanum, it doesn't matter. He's a lovely boy. I've been joined today by Colin Smith, who right back 50 years ago actually crossed the Atlantic. And Colin, I brought in an autograph book, my first ever autograph book, mm. which was uh, bought for me in 1951. And I always remember this story. Went to Sunday school at uh, Adelaide Grove at East Cowes, and our Sunday school teacher, whose name was Miss Hollis, she told us this story of two island men who had sailed the Atlantic in a 20-foot boat. And she actually had your autographs, and I went to look at them afterwards, and she said, would I like them? And there they are, you see, stuck That's in a book. That's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> I've kept that ever since. Yeah, yeah. And you're here today. I'm so thrilled. I don't remember <laughs> signing that, frankly. <laughs> Didn't you? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you had a few problems. What about radios? How did you get on for a radio on board? Well, no, the idea of a radio uh, initially was that we would be able to get time checks. Now, that ties in, of course, with the navigation. To sail across the Atlantic, we needed certain navigation equipment. That included um, um, nautical almanacs, nautical tables and so on. We had a beautiful little yacht sextant. We had a couple of wristwatches, no chronometer, no deck watch or anything of that sort. And we thought, well, now, we can always get a time check on the radio. And um, that was going to position us accurately for longitude on the way across. From the time we left Halifax Harbour, we didn't get a sound out of the thing. So after a few days, we just dropped it over the side and that was that. <laughs> Whether the fishers made any more of it, I don't know. Were you well togged out in, in sort of yachting gear? or <laughs> We had no yachting gear at all. We had no Peter Storm uh, sailing gear or anything snazzy like that. <laughs> As I remember it, I had my old um, grey flannel trousers. I had a, an old Colombo-type raincoat. <laughs> And a sports jacket, and a kind of a bomber jacket type of thing. My brother was uh, fitted out in much the same way. There were no such things as um, special yachting gear and that sort of thing. As for life jackets, of course, we never heard of those. So, um, were you scared knowing that <laughs> England was a long way away? <laughs> we had built the boat ourselves. In fact, from the time we arrived in Canada until the time we'd left was somewhat less than four months we knew what had gone into it, and we were pretty confident in the strength and ability of the boat herself. We weren't scared on that account. We were scared perhaps on account of our own fallibilities and so on, whether we could manage it and so on. But the whole thing was a wonderful adventure to us. At that sort of age, um, if you set your mind on anything, you can do anything. That's how we felt about it, of course, and that's how most people would. Sleeping bags, did you have? Sleeping bag, we had... In fact, we took two sleeping bags for ourselves and one spare. When we got underway, we only ever slept in the one of them, which is the least saturated of the three. They mopped up water just like blotting paper, these things. We had to curl up in one little dry corner in the bag, and when we had the fine day, we put them out on the top of the um, dinghy up, up top, lashed it down to try and dry it out as best we could, and that's how we managed but, of course, we were young and fit and um, 
we coped all right. What about food, Colin? Now, food. Uh, Stan made the mistake of appointing me the official um, supplier of food, etc., for the voyage. And on the whole, I did all right, I think. But we decided that our basic food would be ship's biscuit or cabin biscuits, as they were called. And uh, I tried to estimate how many of these things we would need. And I estimated them by weight. I just did not appreciate just how light these things would be. And when they eventually arrived, a day or so before we were due to go, we had about eight or ten boxes of these big uh, square biscuit tin boxes. <laughs> we couldn't make out how on earth we could stow all these. In the event, we put most of them up forward in our watertight compartment and just had two back in the cabin itself. But on food or provisions generally, um, of course, the most important thing would be water. Now, these gallon cans that one sees around these days, plastic uh, cans, would have been ideal, but there were no such things in those days. We had a special tank made up um, in galvanised steel with a, an opening at the top, which could be sealed down, a tap at the bottom. It held 28 gallons of fresh water. We discovered later that that was just about one quarter of what is regarded as an absolute minimum for two people over that period of time. But anyway, it it did us all right. You had a stove too, didn't you? We had a stove. We had a primer stove. Now, anyone who knows what a primer stove is like, the ordinary basic primer stove, will know that there's a little tray there for starting it off with um, methylated spirit. Now, we had visions of this rolling around and these little blue flames rolling around over the uh, cabin floor and cabin sole and so on, uh, up into the stores and all the rest of it. And uh, that worried us somewhat. But we were very lucky. We found the perfect solution to this. We managed to buy some ex-lifeboat stores of what were known as heat tabs. They were little round um, tablets looking like um, peppermints. And there were 96 to a waterproof packet, as I remember it. One of these put into this tray was just sufficient to start that stove off. If it did uh, fall out, we could pick it up quickly and put it back in, and uh, there were no problems. That was a wonderful little stove. We used to sit on the cabin floor with our feet braced on the other side of the boat, and uh, the primers between our knees and hold a, a saucepan or kettle, whatever it was, on top. The other hand holding on to the boat, of course. <laughs> Did you ever have a dream of being sort of run over by a big liner or anything? Was that a sort of a problem, a worry for you or not well, really? Well, we didn't think it was too great a problem, in fact. Uh, we didn't see too many ships on the way across. I think we were about five days out when we first saw our first ship. And strangely enough, she spotted us as well. She came up alongside and said, where are you bound? We said, England. Did you say New England? <laughs> no, the answer was England. <laughs> Are you all right? Anything you need? We said, no, we're fine, thank you very much. But uh, can you report us safe and well? Which she did. Terrific. And that, in fact, was the first inkling that anyone over here had of uh, our intentions and the fact that we'd actually set sail. Nobody knew that what we were planning really? about no, this. No one from the island we, knew, we had, did they? No, we hadn't told our family at all about it. We didn't want to worry them, of course. <laughs> right. But, of course, this immediately came out now. This ship reported a tiny little boat sailing across for England, only a few hundred miles up Nova Scotia, and then she disappeared for weeks and weeks. Nothing more was heard of her until about halfway across when we spoke to another ship, but that's uh, a little bit later in the program. You saw whales and porpoises and jellyfish, didn't you? We did. Um, our first sight of um, life out there was a fish which took up station about um, six or eight feet astern of the boat. I, I should think he was about um, three foot long, and he stayed there around for two or three days. We had no gear for catching him, of course, but I, I, I don't know if we would have done, even if we could. You got, um, you got sort of attached to that's it. That's right, of course. <laughs> yeah. But uh, then we ran into the, some of the gulf weed that comes up from the Gulf Stream and then drifts across the Atlantic as the west wind drift. We uh, sailed through rafts of this um, a bright, yellowy, mustard-coloured um, weed and we pulled out some of this aboard and it was absolutely full of life. Little shellfish, little things like shrimps, small-coloured fish swimming about 
insects even, all sorts of things there. So uh, that was our first sign. Later on, we saw various other items. You mentioned whales. Yes. We were somewhere out at that time and suddenly heard a, a noise alongside, like a big puff, <laughs> looked out, and there was a whale blowing up, <laughs> almost alongside us, about 20 feet away, I suppose, and then another one. Now, we hadn't had the opportunity, of course, at that time of um, looking at uh, these beautiful wildlife programs. What was his name? That's Frenchman who put on these programs. Je- Jacques Cousteau. Cousteau, yes, yeah. that's right. So we didn't know what wonderful, friendly creatures these were. And we imagined one being a little bit awkward and coming up underneath us, of course, and uh, turning us over. Of course, nothing like that happened. On another occasion, we had um, porpoises suddenly came on to put on a performance. They just came straight up out of the water, about eight or ten feet, well, a big splash right alongside us. I don't think it was for our benefit, but it, it seemed like that at the time. Colin, did you get very cold in the Atlantic? Was it really cold at night? Um, it got a little bit chilly sometimes. <laughs> I'm we, sure. <laughs> we were damp, of course. It was in the middle of the summer, of course. And later on, at the end of the trip, uh, we were told, weren't you lucky that we, you had such lovely weather across there? Well, they were having lovely weather here, but we didn't get it. <laughs> we got a succession of um, easterly gales. I think it was the kickback on depressions going across or something of that sort. But it was always from the east. We reckoned on a good 70% westerly weather to help us on our way. Well, we didn't get it until we were at least halfway across. And then we got it with a vengeance. I must say. Storms, um, one or two storms? We had, um, I would say it must have been up to storm force, up to force 10 or 11 on one occasion. <laughs> now, when we were on the top of the sea, the wind literally shrieked through the, the rigging. When we were down in the trough, we were too busy hanging on to things to worry about um, where the wind was, of course, but very big seas and terrific um, seas coming aboard as well at that time. By which time, of course, we had little hatches to close up the uh, space at the aft end of the, the, the cabin where we'd normally just sit to steer the boat. We had a sea anchor out over the stern, kind of makeshift sea anchor, and the boat was just left to our own devices. I think you went over the side once, Colin, didn't you? I did, in fact. What had happened, we'd had some rather bad weather, and um, it was just getting quite pleasantly fine afterwards. The breeze had dropped down to a, a nice full sail breeze directly from the west and we were on a dead run in a quite a big lumpy sea in fact. Now I was really enjoying myself, I was on watch at the time, I had one foot on the tiller, one hand holding the main sheet, just playing the boat and really enjoying the little sail there. At that moment my brother handed me up a plate full of food. And I think it rather distracted me, and uh, <laughs> I lost my concentration. The next moment, the boat jibed, and I shot straight over to the, the other side and into the water. Lost my plate of dinner, incidentally. <laughs> but when I came up, I suddenly realised that I was looking at that little boat out there, sailing on her own for the very first time out on the Atlantic. We'd been aboard it, of course. Um, the boat was all round us, but we hadn't seen it sailing like that. A moment later, Stan's head popped up over the cockpit and I yelled out, Stan, she looks marvellous from here. (laughs) Now, I wasn't just being facetious, in fact. I was trying to reassure him that I was all right. And the next second, he disappeared. The boat disappeared because a big wave had come in between us. And for the next few minutes, we were only in sight of each other for a few seconds at a time. My brother, in fact, had done exactly the right thing he had immediately jied the boat around and come around to try and pick me up. But in those conditions, you can very easily lose somebody. You have nothing to get your direction by other than the direction of the wind itself. And uh, if you only spot a head for a few moments here and then it disappears again, you can very easily lose someone. Um, suddenly, the boat appeared almost above me and uh, I grabbed the rail and I was very quickly aboard again. I was rather glad that she has a rather low freeboard. As I'm sure fact. you were. Now, Stan afterwards told me that um, he used to have nightmares about this episode 
uh, arriving back in England and trying to explain how he'd managed to leave his brother and shipmate out in the middle of the Atlantic. But it could easily have been done, in fact. Telling me. You also <laughs> once had a problem with time, and, and a, a boat oh, uh, came along and, and told you the time, was that yes. right? Yes. Now, having mentioned earlier about our little radio over the side, um, for longitude, one relies absolutely on accurate timing. Now, we had our two wristwatches, but for some reason they went a bit out of kilter with each other or something like that. We didn't know which one was right or if they were both wrong, in fact. And so, um, longitude was a big problem. Latitude was no problem at all. We could get a sun meridian altitude of the sun each day when the sun was there. So we knew where we were, north and south, but not how far east and west. They use a term in navigation, circle of uncertainty. Now, we didn't have a circle of uncertainty. We had a very elongated ellipse of uncertainty. Only a few miles north and south, but several hundred miles east and west. But um, one day when we a ship uh, suddenly appeared and um, almost on a course to pass us very closely, she spotted us and came alongside and we were looking a bit bedraggled. It was just after a period of rather rough weather. We had the warp still out over the stern. There's no sail set or anything of that sort. And then they hailed us and said, do you wish to be rescued? We said, no, thank you. We're perfectly all right. <laughs> but can you please give us our longitude? And they did. They said, 30 degrees west. Now, we being supreme optimists, well, we had to be, of course, or we wouldn't have been out there. <laughs> we thought we were much further over than that. And we said, did you say 13? He said, no, 30 degrees. And he held up his 10 fingers or fingers yeah. and thumb three times to make it clear to us. Then we asked him for a time check. And he gave us a, a, an accurate time check. We set both our watches correctly. And after that, I have to say that they kept in perfect synchro with each other. So that eventually when we came up, uh, one day I said, told Stan I'd just been working out some sites Stan, we should be just about looking at the Fastnet Rock somewhere about noon today. Well, in fact, we didn't see it at noon that day. And we went on through the afternoon into the evening and it had got dark again and suddenly Stan said, Cool, light that lamp and bring it up here. There's a ship bearing right down on us. And I was busy trying, fumbling about trying to get this paraffin lamp going. And he said, it's all right, it's a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be the old head of Kinsale <laughs> in Southern Ireland. There was a happy ending. You got across in about 43 days, was it? A total of 43 days. Amazing. And the Daily Express sort of adopted you because it made world headlines, Absolutely. didn't it? Absolutely. You were on all those sort of newsreels that people saw in the cinemas. It's quite incredible. If you did it these days, you wouldn't even got couple of inches in the county press, I think. As soon but as you... in those days, it was totally different. I know. M not many people had done that kind of thing. <laughs> Telling me. <laughs> not many. <laughs> and they wished you off to uh, London, didn't they? They did, the Daily Express. Yes. Made a real fuss of you, really. Well, I, it's quite incredible, the sort of reception that we got in those days. First, down at Dartmouth, because we came right along the coast. We didn't put into Falmouth, or Plymouth, or anywhere like that. We were determined that it was going to be Dartmouth to deliver our letter to the mayor of Dartmouth, England. And so that's where we made for. They were getting a bit impatient um, by that time because the wind dropped off the following, the last night. And um, I had to admit that we were towed the last few yards into the harbour there. You were sort of superheroes to the rest of the world in a way, weren't you? <laughs> well, so it appeared at that time. I, incredible to think now. Lots of people do it probably these days and you think nothing about it. <laughs> not in sports jacket and flannels, they do. No, perhaps not. Not in their own built boat either, perhaps. But there it is. Looking back, do you think you were mad or not really? I think we were just young and full of life. We'd um, been through the war years. We'd been in the, the RAF and had a wonderful time there, if I may say so. Met some very fine chaps and whatnot. We were just full of life and that was a wonderful adventure to us. That was the real reason behind it. Eventually you got a great welcome when you got back to Yarmouth, didn't you? <laughs> it was a completely out of this world welcome there. I don't know how they didn't sink the key there. <laughs> it was completely crowded. They couldn't have put a pin between them all there. I have a photograph of them. You, can, you, you can't see the key for, for people there. They gave us a wonderful welcome there. And our old friend Captain Cole there, I think he was probably behind the reception, made a wonderful speech and he said, um, in fact, 
Now, the next time you do this, <laughs> there's a little port down on the southern end of Nova Scotia called Yarmouth. I knew exactly what was coming by that time, of course. Set out from Yarmouth and make Yarmouth your first port of call in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Did you sort of like all that fuss, I suppose? Well, no, we were uh, to wreck embarrassed. We had rather silly grins on their face, <laughs> uh, frozen, looking at our old school pals and all that around and waving to us and all this business, of course. Colin, thank you so much for coming in. It's, it's great to celebrate your 50th anniversary since crossing the Atlantic in thank a 20-foot boat. An incredible story. Thank you very much. And you're looking pretty good as well. I'm not too bad, am I? It hasn't done me too much harm. And you don't stop talking, which is perfect. Well, that was super smashing great, wasn't it? Jim Bowen here, just reminding you, you've been listening to John Hannum on Isle of Wight Radio. Today we've celebrated the life of Colin Smith, a wonderful sailor who died in early 2018. I got to know Colin very well over the years and never tired of listening to his uh, sailing stories, particularly the one in 1949, which I still think was amazing. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannah Meets archives and new interviews. Bye-bye for now.